Hi there, welcome back to Floating in Books. Today's video is going to be about all the books that I read in July, August and September. So yeah, I thought I could come on here to update you on the different books I read over the summertime. I did already do two videos where I updated you what I did read in 21 and what I read in 2022 from January until June. And in the past year, year and a half, I have really struggled keeping my reading on point, you could say. I'm not reading as much as I used to. The kind of books I'm reading has also very much slowed down my reading pace. So far in the entire year, I don't think I've read a book yet that I've given five stars. So there are a couple of books that I loved, some of them are in today's video, but they were like good books, like four star reads, but nothing has really like got my reading pace really going where I fly through books like I used to in the past. So maybe it's also just down to the kind of books that I have selected to read. And in today's video, I'm going to chat to you about nine books because that's the amount of books that I read over the past three months. And there is a couple of audiobooks involved as well, which is why the physical copies that I'm holding up in the uh, thumbnail aren't exactly everything that I read. So the first book I finished, I finished in the uh, in early July and it was The Strangler Vine by M.J. Carter. Now this is a book series that has been on my shelves for ages. I bought these books already when I, before I moved to this place and they hadn't been read yet. So I decided to finally pick these up and originally I found this series through the second or third book I feel. That's what I found in my local bookstore and then I was like, oh, this sounds like something I might like, but this was the first book in the series. So I did buy myself some the first book as well. And I thought I should pick that up first so that we're properly introduced to these characters. This is promoted as a Blake and Avery adventure. It's historical detective, which I usually love. And this is one of those like Victorian thriller mystery kind of things. Um, which I generally enjoy. It's just that very often the setting I prefer is a city like London. Um, also because I know a lot about London in the Victorian period, so I can sort of imagine a little bit better what that might have been like. And with this book, when I got into it, because I hadn't read the blurb yet again, I was just like, oh yeah, this is on my historical detective series shelf. So it's historical detectives and I usually like those. And so I went into it quite blindly. And at first I couldn't get into this at all. And in the end, I ended up liking it a lot better once I sort of got a feel for what this story is actually about. So in this story, we meet uh, William Avery and he is going to, uh, he's in the army in India. So yes, it's British empire related, but very much when the British empire was still an empire, um, so he is located in Calcutta, I believe, yes, and he is going to, uh, he's going through some personal issues, he has some debt, he isn't really liking his position all that much, uh, and then one day he is linked to Jeremiah Blake, who is uh, tasked to track down Blake's favorite author who is lost somewhere in India, so they're gonna try and track him down to see if they can find him. Um, and that's Xavier Mount Stewart. And in the end, this worked really, really well. Um, Blake, Jeremiah Blake is someone who's lived in India for a very long time and who's really tried to like, you know, get used to the traditional customs of the original uh, inhabitants of the country and like figuring out how, you know, things work and what kind of nature there is, whereas um, Avery is a little naive and very English and that of course clashes so we get this like cultural perspective because of that and in the end it becomes this like thriller mystery thing but at first you get just a lot of facts and the one thing that held me back in enjoying this at the start is because I just lacked a lot of knowledge about India at the end of the 19th century so that's down to me not knowing enough but the book does explain a lot of the things and a lot of the like political tension that was going on at the time. And especially towards the end of the book, these things are explained a lot better. And that's when things start coming together. And that's also when you start understanding a little bit more 
where some of these things are coming from. So I do feel this takes about half the book to really understand what's going on and why issues are issues and how things work. Uh, because we are told this story through this Avery character who is very English and has a lot of disdain for local inhabitants. So it takes a while for him to come around. And as he comes around as a reader, you also get more, you, you can get into it a bit more, I feel, um, because his per perspective starts off as just being very limited, I feel. Um, so that's a narrative choice that does hold back the story a little bit, I feel. But in the end, this was enjoyable enough. And it's one of those like classic, like Sherlock Holmes and Watson inspired bantered kind of relationships these two main characters have. We have the the older genius and the more uh, naive apprentice and that's a trope you see a lot in these historical detective dramas. But it's a trope I enjoy so I will definitely continue on with the series. I have the two other books in the series as well. I don't know if there is any more but I have three books and I intend to read the other ones as well. I think, let me check. <laughs> what what did I rate it? I don't know. Oh, for me this was a three star read though. So okay enough, like enjoyable, but nothing like super mind blowing. Then I read When the Body Says No on audiobook by Gabor Mate. And this was one of those books that, you know, in terms of like self help, I saw it popping up everywhere. And this, for how much hype this gets, I have that with a lot of like self-help and like non-fiction-y books like this. We have another one coming up next where it's just so much about anecdotes and so little of it is actually linked to proper statistics and research that I felt it like especially for the entire book like some of it is good and some of the points he tries to make are very valid especially if you're going through a stressful situation and how that can like put strain on the body. I get that. I get that. But after like so many examples of all these different people who have ended up with very serious illnesses where he claims it's all due to them having very stressful lives um, without any sort of evidence or anything sort of backing him up. After case after case after case after case. And because he does the same thing all the time, rather than making me see that he is right, I felt actually a little discouraged by it. And by the end of the book, I just started to dislike the book even more. So for me, this just wasn't a great one. Um, if you're going to claim these kind of things, then I also want you to dig into the science of it. And that didn't happen at all. And I was like waiting, when is the science going to happen? So yeah, I, I listened to this in July and it was it was fine. I definitely got something out of it, but for me this, I wouldn't recommend this necessarily unless you're very interested in the topic. For me this was two stars just because it ended up going nowhere. And I felt similarly about a much hyped up book uh, called The Pain Gap, How Sexism and Racism in Healthcare Kill Women by Anoushe Hussein. Um, this was another two star read for me. I read it right after When the Body Says No and I had heard so many people talking about it, how this book really sort of, you know, advocates for women in the medical space and how it like, like really goes into the differences between men and women and how women are set back. And it does that in the first two chapters. And then the rest of it, it's very similar to when the body says no, it just keeps reiterating the same point. There are very few statistics or evidence or research to really back it up. And it just becomes this anecdotal uh, event where, you know, people just have just told their story and she uses it as examples, but we just get a lot of examples and we don't get a lot of like context for those examples to for it to really land. So I feel this could have been better if it had some more statistics backing it up. Plus it's very much a, a US based uh, story. So I would also like to see more examples from different territories and how this works across the globe rather than just <sighs> like women in America. There is more than women in America and I feel that therefore the perspective this book gives is again too limited to what it could potentially do. 
uh, and what I wanted to get out of it. Again, does this book raise some really interesting points? Does it do a couple of really good things? Yes, but what I've heard people claim that this is like the ultimate feminist manifest on, you know, how women are treated differently in healthcare. I didn't get that out of it. So that's why for me, this was only two stars. The next book I read, I think I finished this also in July, was God's Gave Grave by Jay Kristoff. Now, this is the second book in the Never Night series by him. And this is a book series that is very sort of divisive. I feel that I haven't heard a lot of people talking positively about it, let's put it that way. And a lot of people don't like the female character that we get in here. Her name is Mia. Uh, in the first book, we see her, we follow her as she uh, like attends initiation in a secret society in this world that is uh, pretty much assassins. They're a, a, it's sort of like religion based, but they're assassins at the same time. And she wants to become part of this so she can avenge her father. And one of the main critiques this writing gets is that Jay Kristoff was trying to write a strong female character and kind of lost the plot as he was doing it. That's not my issue with these books. My issue with this book series is how repetitive it is. We get a lot of descriptions that are repeated over and over and over again, which I think can deter people from really getting into the story. Um, the first book also has a lot of footnotes and that can also take away from the reading experience. There are far fewer footnotes to explain the world in this story and I actually feel in terms of world building, this second book is doing a much better job at giving us like a magical version of the Roman Empire, because that's definitely what this setting is. But since the first book focuses much more on this church and this assassination plot to sort of get the rest moving, I feel we don't get a lot from the outside world, which is why I feel if you've only read the first book in this series, you can't really judge it because in the second book the world is expanded a lot more because Mia now works for this church and is far more out in the world and she does a lot more than just being an assassin. The revenge plot is taking center stage here, which is again not the best plot and I feel there are certain twists and turns that are very convenient in these books as well. So they definitely have flaws. But in terms of did I enjoy this and was it a fast paced read and I read this in like a day and a half and I haven't experienced that kind of reading pace with any book in a while. So to get me out of sort of like a slump, this was great and I really enjoyed it. Did, did I love all the characters? No, but you know me, I love my unlovable characters. So for me, th this was a four star read. Was it the best book I've ever read? No. But it definitely deserved a star more than just like being an, an okay, good book that I might want to continue. I really enjoyed myself reading while I was reading this. So for me, yes, it has a lot of flaws. I can see them, but flaws apart. I mean, I like this. I really, really did. And I really enjoyed the way this was paced. It's just really fast paced, action packed. This read like a movie script. And for some reason, those are the kind of books that really get me out of reading slumps. I mean, Ben Aronovich's Peter Grant series also has it flaws, but I enjoy that for a similar reason. And that's why God's Grave was definitely a four star read for me. I don't want to say too much about the plot because if you haven't read the first one, I could give away plot points from that. Um, but yeah, we get, we, we get gladiators in this and sort of like Hunger Games-esque kind of tests that need to be completed. And I liked it. Next up was another audiobook, which I think I finished also in July. So July was a good, pretty good reading month, especially because I got some of these audiobooks in. This was a Dutch one, Zorg by Lynn Berger. And this is a, uh, uh, like it was owned by a company that I already read some other books by as well. So if you've seen my other videos, you might know. But this was published by The Correspondent, which is a journalistic platform here in the Netherlands. They used to do an English version, but they ran out of money, I think. So because they shut that one down. Um, but the articles that they did publish in English are still up, so you can read some if you'd like. Um, and their 
correspondents, like their writers do write books as well, and then they publish them. And they also immediately pub 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 publish them as audiobooks. And this was supposed to be like about the Dutch healthcare system, I thought. Um, and it ended up, again, not doing that. The same issue I had with some of the other audiobooks I listened to, this was very anecdotal. And some of the correspondence stuff does that from time to time, and sometimes I feel it works, and sometimes I feel it doesn't, and in this case, I feel it didn't. Um, so here, again, I felt not enough focus on, like, the hardcore facts, and too much focus on experiences of people, and too little context also for how things might change in the future. When I read these kind of books, I do want to also have the author have like a section towards the end of like, how can we move forward? And it just didn't really happen here. So again, for me, this was a two star read. And for this audiobook that also had to do with the narrator, it was narrated by the author. And I thought her voice was very difficult to listen to. Not gonna lie. And then it's turned out to being August, um, and in August I read just one book. Sally Rooney's Beautiful World, Where Are You? So I've read two books by Sally Rooney previously, I've read Conversations with Friends and Normal People, and I liked both. What I read as a physical copy, Normal People and Conversations with Friends, I listened to as an audiobook. And with this, I bought it pretty much straight away when it released, and I was like, okay, great, I love me some Sally Rooney, so I'm going to love this as well. And this was another good book, but I feel it's not as good as Conversation with Friends. That's my favorite one by her. In Beautiful World, Where Are You? We meet uh, four people, Alice, Felix, Eileen, and Simon. And it sort of revolves around mostly around Alice. She's the narrator of the story. And Eileen is her best friend, and they've been best friends for a very long time. Eileen is sort of like running circles around Simon, and she has since their college days. And Alice meets Felix through an online dating app after she's moved to this coastal town in Ireland, whereas Eileen still lives in Dublin. And this was a book that I got started with, and Sally Rooney books aren't necessarily easy reads. I knew that going into it. They can uh, definitely go into some darker themes. Normal People was especially dark. Um, and the um, uh, books also very much deal with adult relationships. So I feel that that's a running theme now that I've read three books by Sally Rooney. It's about people in relationships and how those relationships develop, um, things left unsaid, things that they, you know, people having different expectations yada 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 and in here i also felt we got a bit of an autobiographical like element again because alice probably has parts there that could be sally rooney because alice is also an author who's made it big at a young age and who's traveling the globe the uh, pandemic is definitely playing a role in this book as well so that may be something you need to know going into it and in the end I think that one of the reasons why I did not like this as much as Conversation with Friends is because I just didn't like the people as much. Um, and that's of course fine, I mean there are plenty of unlikable people, but with here I just didn't always understand, like, why would you do it that way? Why would you take that decision? Um, because the entire plot starts revolving around some unfinished business, you could say. And in the at a certain point in this book I felt like, Either everyone is going to hook up together, or there's going to be a huge fight, and they're, they're, they're going to break up and never see each other again. Like, that's the kind of tension that we've got going on in this book. And when the book got to that point, where all the players were in place, I felt it worked really well, and I really enjoyed that latter part of the book. But it takes about half to two-thirds of the book for the book to get there. So, you definitely need to go through like all of the different like little lines and subplot lines and things before things really start happening. So with this book, I felt I was just waiting for things to to start for a very good part of the book. And I, I felt it was just a little too meandering at times and it kind of went nowhere. And then all of a sudden this like plot change happens and I mean, normal people did the same thing, so I kind of knew what to expect there. Um, in the end, I liked this. I liked it enough, that's why it was three stars for me. 
but I don't think this is her best work. Uh, I'm glad I got to read it, but it's not something that I think anyone needs to run out and read. So after that book, I was in for something light and airy, and that's why I picked up the last book in the Nevernight trilogy. This is Dark Dawn by Jay Kristoff. And yes, this continues where the second book left off, so I can't say too much about the plot because that would be giving away certain things. This is where the book got, like the book series really slipped into convenience, I felt. So in this book, we just get a lot of plot lines being resolved, coming together, and some of it happens a little too neatly and certain things have to happen, like certain plot twists are revealed in this book that were quite unnecessary. So I do feel that each book in this series kind of works like a standalone because each book does have its separate plot. There's a lot more political intrigue in this one than in the first two because here we get a lot more going on, but this is, it's just unnecessarily big. Again, with the repetition I've already mentioned going on throughout the series, uh, Mia has two like shadow creatures that have attached themselves to her. That's her magic power. Um, I'm not giving away anything there because that's revealed pretty early on. Um, but we get the same description, and especially if you read these books pretty closely together, you're, you're getting the same descriptions every time. And there were a couple of clever things in here. I definitely like, like, there's a mentor kind of character to Mia in the books. I believe his name is Mercurio. I really enjoy him. Uh, we have some enemies to lovers tropes in here that really play out in the third book. Um, so yeah, there were enjoyable bits here again, but like I said, I think the second book in the series is the strongest because there I feel we get more plot and we get more action and we get much more, we get to see much more of why Mia is such a badass character, whereas in this one it kind of, I don't know, it was convenient, convenient. And there were just there was just a lot more focus here as well on the religious aspect of it. And I felt that that didn't always flawlessly fit together. So I did give it four stars because again, it's super fast paced and it really got the, like really got my reading train going again. So I was very happy while reading it, but I, I definitely feel there are flaws. And for that, I could never give it five stars because this is not a series that I think I want to go back to. It's like not one of my all time favorite series. And by now that that needs to be like, if you want me to give you five stars, that's how I need to feel about your book series, and this isn't it. And then two books that I finished just last week, which is why this video is going to go up a little bit later. I think that's how I want to do it, actually. Like, post my wrap-up, not at the start of the month, but more towards the end of a month. So that I have a little bit more time to gather my thoughts and really know how I feel about certain things. So I finished an audiobook and a physical copy. So I read the final book in the... What's it called? Gower Street Detective Series by M.R.C. Kossasian, um, called Dark Dawn Over Steep House. And this book was the fifth book in a series that I had, I, I, I had listened to all the other four and I was like, might as well finish it. It's another one of those historical detective stories that I like, centered around Marge. Uh, and Marge is um, the ward of Sidney Grice, the only personal detective in 19th century London. And they go into all these different areas of London. It feels very sort of Holmesian, but then instead of Watson, we get like a female character there. Um, so we do go into a little bit more of like the female perspective on Victorian London. Um, but a lot of it felt very gimmicky. And here as well, I felt it was just very long-winded. This book could have been half the book. And that was one of the issues I had when I listened to the fourth book in this series, where I felt like, yeah, plot wise, it's just, it's just trying to be too clever. And then it did the one thing that I dislike about mystery thrillers, where there's a face off with the final villain at the end. And then we, they just explain their entire plan. <laughs> like they just stand and talk for chapters on end, explaining the plan and why they are angry and why they did what they did. So I felt that that sort of showed that this, like, this isn't like the most uh, exciting detective story I've ever read. It went on for too long. It 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 had so many subplots that just didn't have to be there. Characters who were very stereotyped as well, which 
was excruciatingly painful at some times. Like there's a German prince in there, which is just... Like if you've ever watched Allo Allo, like that level of like comedic German stereotypical behavior that that was very much in this book which I thought was a bit of a it, it was just it, it just felt cheap it felt very um very convenient and I think again there is a like hidden Jack the Ripper reference in this book as well which also made me go like Whew. and after listening to this for five books that Grise detective character that is oh so clever just becomes an annoying twat after five, like already after two books, to be quite fair. Um, so it became a bit too annoying, but you know, I wanted to finish the series. So I did finish it, but I only gave it two stars. It wasn't super terrible, but I wouldn't recommend. And finally, the book that I had to finish before I could film this video is Circe by Madeline Mer Miller. And Madeline Miller, I also have the song uh, of Achilles, but for some reason, Circe sounded more intriguing to me. So I decided to start there, and in case you don't know, Madeline Miller is doing these, I'm not sure if that's her spiel by now, but she has two books out where she retells Greek mythology through a female lens, which is why this appealed to me. And so many people rave about this. This was shortlisted for the Women's Prize in Fiction of 2019. So I was like, I'm going to love this. This has so much going for it. I love Greek mythology. Circe as a character is, I think, even though we don't hear much about her anymore, I thought it was great to like, you know, shine a light on a lesser known character from Greek mythology who also happens to be a woman. And then the character is turned into this drab female. And I understand that she's trying to like, show the softness of her female character. I mean, Circe is very much depicted as this evil witch who turns men into pigs um, and is, has been used as this embodiment of all things bad about women for centuries. So I understand she didn't go that route, but for most of this book, Circe doesn't even know she's a witch. And I'm like, wait, what? And we don't get much of her witchery? I mean, literally, the, the, the moment where she finds out she's a witch, that she can actually do witchcraft, and her becoming proficient as a witch, that she knows how to use her powers, takes two paragraphs. Why? I do not understand how this got so hyped up. Uh, I like the writing. It's It's very, very well written in the sense of it being very lovely to read. We get some lovely vocabulary and descriptions in here. But the character of Circe for most of the book... I mean, the purpose of the book is sort of her trying to find herself. So I get that. But for most of the book, she's just this very naive, doesn't know much about the world kind of person. And... That's just not what I had expected. So the blurb on the back very much promotes this as like, you know, you know, Odysseus comes around and Circe, but it takes over half of the book for Odysseus to arrive on her island. And that's when things get interesting indeed. But we get 150 pages of her just not knowing who she is and what she's going to do with her life. And she's just this very naive daddy's girl who doesn't even understand herself and just takes no effort because everyone around her knows and her siblings who also are proficient in witchcraft know that they're witches and know how to use it. And she's just like, everything just happens to her. So she has little to no agency for most of the book. And I'm like, what? why? Why? I mean, especially because this is a character we do not know a lot about. She mainly pops up in the Odyssey by Homer. Um, that's what most of the writings are about. So why this take on Circe? I had just expected to be like her to be like a strong female character who knows her mind, who, but she just like rolls over and accepts that this is her fate and lets everything happen to her. And I'm like, 
she learns along the way, which is what she's got going for it. But that's again why I could not really get into this story at first. It took me, I think, three weeks to read like the first 150 pages. And then I was like, right, I'm going to sit down and read the rest of it. And then I really feel it got a nice pace and the, pa like the pacing just seemed to change. It was like almost like I got two books instead of one. So for me, this wasn't perfect. I can see why people like this a lot. I can definitely like appreciate that this is trying to do something else. But knowing what I know of Circe as a character within Greek mythology, I had just expected more and the book wasn't giving it to me. So I think it mainly has to do with my personal expectations and how things went about. Um, I mean, there were a lot of blanks to fill in here uh, with how little we know of the character. And I feel that this book didn't always succeed in filling in the blanks the way I would have liked to see it happen. So that's why I appreciate this book. I liked it. I gave it three stars. I'm definitely going to be reading The Song of Achilles at some point, but I just wanted more. I wanted Cersei to be a just a very strong character, a newer mind, but as I already mentioned, we don't get a lot of her witchcraft. It kind of she just kind of figures it out and we get none of it. So I I don't know. I she Cersei as a character could have been a lot more interesting than what this book did. That's where I'm gonna leave it. So yeah, those are the nine books that I read in the past couple of months. I hope to be able to speed up my reading pace. I'm going to be updating you on what I've read once a month from now on. So you can expect my next wrap up to go up in a couple of weeks. So if you'd like to stay tuned for more, and then I hope to see you in my next video. Bye-bye, see you next week.